Welcome back, everybody, to a little less fear podcast. I'd like to introduce Liam Naden. Did I say your name correct? Yes, you did. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the show here. Liam is a speaker, teacher, writer, and researcher. He helps you understand the process for creating true success in your life by understanding how to use your brain the right way, overcoming your problems, achieving your goals, and ending frustrations. He is the host of the podcast, Using Your Brain for Success, and creator of Neural State Rebalancing, also known as NSR, a process which automatically gets the four parts of your brain working the right way to bring you the life you want. Leo is also an experienced marriage and relationships coach, host of the Growing in Love for Life podcast, author of more than 20 books, and creator of four relationship coaching programs. We're going to discuss how to achieve the results you want using your brain the right way. Thank you, and welcome to A Little Less Your Podcast, Liam. Thank you, Lino. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So good to be My here. Mine too. So how did you discover all of this? It seems as far as like NSR, neural state rebalancing, how did you come into this discovery? Was it by accident or was it through research? Well, it was really a bit of both. The accident part was... Um, in my mid-40s, I was doing pretty well financially. I was a multimillionaire and uh, had the, all of the trappings of success. And then pretty well overnight, I lost everything and became homeless and ended up uh, having to move back in with my elderly, elderly mother and sleep on the sofa in her small apartment in the living room. So that was a big wake-up call to me because before that, I'd really not only achieved success, but I'd been a real student of success. I'd studied all sorts of different aspects of how you can be the best that you can be, how you can achieve goals. I, I went down all sorts of paths. I was brought up in a religious family, and I was told that the key to success, if you want to be happy and successful, is through prayer and praying to God, and God will give you what you want didn't quite work for me, work out too well. I didn't get everything I prayed for, even though I did pray a lot. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, but then I tried all sorts of different things. I set up my own business because I was told, well, actually, before that, I, was, uh, I thought, well, an education is what you need. So I went to university for seven years and amassed a few degrees and became a bit of an expert in classical music, actually. Wow, and, that's um, incredible. <laughs> yeah. But um, I still wasn't that happy, and I still didn't really feel successful and again the people who I was associating with the very educated professors although they knew a lot and uh -huh. I knew a lot didn't seem to really translate into being happy and successful they seemed to have the same problems as everybody else and the same problems as I had sure so then I then I thought well um or somebody probably told me <clears throat> go and set up your own business that's how you become successful and happy get out there make a lot of money so I did that and I set up my own business, and I, I certainly did make a lot of money. And I was certainly able to do things with the money that I otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be able to. But I had lots of stress and problems, and I started to buy into this whole idea that we're all told, which is that problems and stress are a natural part of life. And if you want to be successful, problems and overcoming great obstacles and challenges that's part of it. You have to learn to accept that. But I'd always had this idea, well, maybe life's not supposed to be that stressful because I was continually trying to solve my problems and get to a place where I wasn't stressed. But they just seemed that, you know, this roller coaster of achieving goals and feeling good and then more problems and stress kept coming along. So then I went down the whole personal development, self-help, self-improvement um, area. And I studied everything. I went to seminars all over the world. I did courses. I read books. I, I used to listen to all these sort of subliminal tapes where you, where it's supposed to help you reprogram your subconscious mind and change your beliefs and change your thoughts. And I learned how to set goals and, and work on achieving goals and doing all these things, you know, even things like carrying around a little card with affirmations, positive statements that you'd read to yourself every day. Well, I did all of that. But when I got to the point where I lost everything, I looked back on everything that I'd tried. And I also did, by the way, a lot of spiritual stuff as well, meditation, which I still do. Um, but I did a lot of other spiritual practices trying to find out how can you be happy and successful and be in control of your life? Yes. So when I was asleep, when I was sleeping on the rather uncomfortable sofa in my mother's mm. 
apartment, I, I started to reflect on this and say, how did I end up in this situation? Right. Because I've studied success all my life and I've had some success, but I've always been led to believe you're in control of your life and you can make whatever you want happen. So that didn't seem to equate with the fact that I didn't, I, that I felt totally helpless. Yeah. And I thought, how did this happen to me? This wasn't in the plan. I, you know, and I should be able to make sure I don't get in this situation again. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing all, what I do about success. So I thought, well, none of that, that hasn't really helped me avoid losing everything. And I was in, as I say, I was in my mid forties. I wasn't particularly young. <laughs> so yeah. it was a bit, a bit of a shock. That's my age. But, yeah. Wow. Well, I can't, I, that's, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's crazy that you went through this. Yeah. Turned out to be a great gift, of course, because it's why I'm here talking to you now and why I right, true. came to a, came to learn what I came to learn because what I thought was I need to take a different approach that hasn't really worked and I don't know how to get out of the situation I'm in I had because I had no clue on how to I'd had no idea on how to rebuild my life if you like I had no idea on how to make money or get off my mother's couch so but what happened was I did get through that whole situation and things got better and they got a lot better and things were quite different, things to what I'd previously experienced. Because, for instance, I attracted a, I had a much better relationship with somebody new that I, a, a different style of relationship to what I'd ever had before. You know, it wasn't wasn't full of problems and stress. This was really a really happy relationship, which I still have, by the way. And I noticed I started to set up businesses and do some entrepreneurial things to make money. And I was also doing things that I really enjoyed, some travel and doing things that I'd always wanted to do. So I was making all the money I needed. I was having the lifestyle I wanted. And I thought, you know, there's something really interesting about this. The most interesting thing for me, I thought, I don't really have any problems or stress. For the first time in my life, I actually feel happy, really happy. And I feel like I'm actually in control of my life. And I wake up in the morning not dreading my email inbox <laughs> like I used to, but looking forward to the day and being excited and, and really feeling that things were going well. And the other interesting thing was before I'd really pretty well all my life, I would chased success. You know, I went after it and I always was setting goals and trying to get more and trying to struggle and overcome problems and push, push, push to be successful. But this time around, I, I felt, well, I'm not really pushing. It's it's almost like people are coming to me. Opportunities are coming to me. Ideas are coming to me. I'm not having to go out there and try and force them and look for them that hard. And sure, I had to work on or, or sort of I had to implement the ideas or put in some effort, but it wasn't this struggle and and, you know, battle with problems all the time. And I thought what I realized was I need to figure out what I'm doing differently because whatever it is, I don't want to stop. I want yeah. to make sure I keep doing it. You want, want to keep riding that, that wave. Yeah, I don't want to get back into that situation I was in yeah. where, you know, life is just full of problems and stress. And I thought, you know, maybe life doesn't need to be that way because it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually doing everything I want to do. In fact, I'm doing things that I never thought I'd want to do, but I'm, I'm doing them, if you like. So anyway... That's what led me to try and figure out what I'd done different, what I was doing differently. And I had all of this knowledge and information from all of these different areas. And I, start, and I started to pull things together and get, and I got confused again with, well, what's really going on here? So I thought, well, why don't I just put all of that aside and start from the beginning and ask myself, who am I and what am I doing here? Pretty basic question. And of course, these the questions thing, that you asked yourself, Liam, was this during meditation or was it was it just a walk in the park or just a natural question you just asked yourself out of the blue? It was pretty much out of the blue. It was I was probably thinking about it and thinking, you know, I, what what can how, how can I make sense of what's going on? And that and that and, the, and that question just came to me because I thought everything else is confusing, mm -hmm. but maybe there's some basis to if I can figure out who I am and why I'm here, or if I can get an answer to that question, that gives me a foundation to say, well, what am I doing differently, if you yes. like? And what I realized was that even though we all have different ideas about who we are, and there have been different philosophies and teachings and spiritual traditions about who we are, I thought, well, there's one 
despite all of that, you know, we can all disagree on that, but I thought there's one thing I know for certain, and that is I have a physical component. I live in a physical body. I'm in a physical world. This is a, a biological experience, if you like, and I'm in a biological world. So there must be some purpose to who I am biologically and how I function biologically. So I looked into biological science to, to ask the question, what is the purpose of life? Because we all have life. We're, we're alive physically. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose? And it turns out that all of biological science has answered that question, and they've all come up with the same answer. And the answer is, you're here biologically to survive and thrive. In other words, you're here not only for your own survival, but for the survival of the species. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of life is to create more life. And you do that by being able to survive and thrive yourself. And of course, that leads to the next conclusion, which is, well, what does it mean to survive and thrive? Well, it means being the best that you can be. Because yeah. when you're the best that you can be, that gives you the greatest chance for surviving and thriving. Right. And it's not just a physical thing. Obviously, physically, if you're your strongest and healthiest, that gives you the greatest chance to fight off attackers or you know, fight disease or heal from injury mm -hmm. in a much more resilient way. But also mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, when you're, when you're at your best, you are your most resourceful and creative and uh, motivated. Mm -hmm. And you contribute the most, not only to your own survival and, and your own well-being, but to that of society as well. And being your best mentally, spiritually, and emotionally is being your happiest. That's mm -hmm. when you're, be you're best. That's when you're your most creative and all of those things. So, you know, it, logically, I, I realize that your biological purpose is to be happy. You're here to be happy. And I thought, well, that's weird. So why do I, why do I have so many, did I have so many problems? Yeah, right. And why does everybody have problems that can't, you know, because problems don't do anything for your biological survival. They actually harm you and yeah, makes limit worse. Yeah, they make. Yeah, they definitely do. They they damage you, so they can't have any biological purpose to you know problems and stress really. And and it turns out they don't. And we'll explain why when we talk about the brain. But but I thought, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, okay, so so that all makes sense. So if my biological purpose is to be the best that I can be, which is to be happy, not stressed, without and not have problems, then has nature provided anything for me to allow that to happen? Has nature provided anything for every species? Because every species has the same function. What has nature provided for me and all humans to enable us to be the best we can be? And it turns out it's provided us with this very specific machine, which is our brain. And our brain, its specific role is to make sure we survive and thrive. So it's not just there to make us survive and, and stay alive. It's there to make us the best that we can be, the happiest, including the happiest that we can be. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that your brain is designed not only to make you happy, but to make sure you avoid problems and you avoid stress. And I thought, you know, this is what I'm doing. I must be using my brain in a different way because it's creating for me a life where I, where I am happy, where I don't have stress and problems, unlike right. my previous life, if you like. So I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. I need to find out about the brain. and. The first thing I realized about the brain when I started studying it was just how incredibly powerful it is. We've never been taught, if, if we realized how powerful our brain was, we'd probably put down everything else and just want to figure out how can we use this thing the right way to, to get what we want, because it's designed to do that. But, you know, it's, it's infinitely more powerful than any computer or any other machine or anything that exists on Earth. And many, many scientists have, have said exactly the same thing. And because it has all of this power, it really does have the ability to do the job it's designed for, which is to give you the best life possible, to make you the best that you can be. It has the power to do that. But the other interesting thing I realized when I started to study the brain, and I did a lot of technical study and you know, scientific and psycho psychological research and all of these things, and I pulled it together into a model because what I realized, a simple model, is that the brain, although it's infinitely powerful, it literally is no different to any other machine. It is a machine. It, it operates on very exact principles. It works in a very exact way. 
And if you use it the way it's designed, it does its job, which is to make you the best you can be. And if you don't use it the right way, that's when you end up with problems. Yeah, viruses because, and all other kinds of things that a, that a machine or a computer ends up with as well. Yeah, well, well I, the analogy I think is, uh, that I like to use is a motor car. I mean, you know a motor car is a machine, and you know what it's designed to do. It's designed to get you from where you are to where you want to go, and easily, comfortably, efficiently, and predictably. You know that it's just it's going to get you there. That's what it's designed to do. And you don't need to um, have any doubt that it'll do that, but you do need to learn how to drive it. You do need how to use it the right way, because if you don't know how, how to drive a car, imagine somebody just, you know, you come out of the, I don't know, out of the jungle and you've never seen a car before and you and you and you and you and they say to you, well you use that to get to to the next village or wherever you want to go. Okay. Well how but how do I use it? Right. And 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 you might get into the car and you look at all these levers and buttons and you've got no clue how to use it. So you might think, oh well it's got wheels. Perhaps the way to use it is to get out from behind and push. Maybe I need to push the car to where it, it needs to go. That's how it works. That makes sense. So you get out and you push with all of your energy and with determination and motivation and you push as hard as you can and you struggle. And if it moves at all, it, it moves very slowly and it wears you out. You become exhausted. And then you might think, not knowing anything about cars, oh, the problem is I'm not strong enough. <laughs> I need to build up my energy and become more determined, more motivated, stronger so I can push this car harder. And really, that's it sounds crazy, isn't it? But this is what we do with our brain. Okay. Or we, we get into it and we go, well, what are all these levers for? Someone comes along to us and says, look, unless you know how to drive this, you're not going to get anywhere. It's a ridiculous idea thinking you can just get into a car and drive it. And the brain's exactly the same, but no one's ever taught us how to drive our brain. But it's exactly the same. It's a machine. It works in a very exact way. And when you use it the right way, it does its job, getting you to where you want to go easily, enjoyably, predictably, and having a great journey. But if you don't, it's a bit like trying to drive a car with the handbrake on and your foot on the accelerator. The engine makes some bad noises. You stutter along or things aren't working right. You, you've got problems showing up and you get all stressed and worried because it doesn't seem to be working right. And But it's purely because you, no one's taught you how to drive it and you're using it the wrong way. So this really took me down the rabbit hole, if you like, of understanding how the brain works. And I've come up with a model which is based on science and psychology and how our brain actually works. But I've simplified it in a way that anyone can understand, because I think one thing I realized, a lot of the research, and it's understandable, any research, people who research one particular topic can become very technical. And you know, I remember from my university background, I mean, I could understand all of the stuff I was had learned about music, but trying to explain it to someone else, it was like, well, you know, they're not going to understand because it's all pretty deep right. and technical and complicated, and you have to know a lot. And it's the same with the science of the brain. I think when when you look at psychology and and brain science, there's a lot of very technical language, and and people are sort of coming at it from different angles. So what I've done is I've put it into a simple model that every, anyone can understand. And the great thing is. It's like a car. You don't need to know what every little wire is called in a car or, or what every little, you know, how, what it exactly does. You just need to know a few things, basic things on how to drive it. And it's the same with your brain. That's the model I've created, which just explains how your brain works in a quite a simple way, but a, an accurate and powerful way. I love that analogy. <laughs> I can clearly see it all. I love the analogy. So tell us yeah. more about, about the model. Okay, well, here's how your brain works. And, and when I explain this, people go, I'm sure they'll go, aha, now I know why I have problems and stress in my life <laughs> and why it's doing it wrong. Basically, there are four parts to your brain. <clears throat> There's, and I've obviously they've got technical terms, but these are all physical places in your brain where different activities take place. So this isn't just an idea. This is actually based on biology of, of your brain. The first part of your brain is your what I call your thinking brain. Okay, now this is located on the top of your head. And what your thinking brain does is it takes all of the information that you get in, from your environment in every moment. So what it, that comes from your five senses. 
So whatever you see, smell, taste, touch, or hear in every moment, and also from your thoughts, all of this information is brought into your thinking brain and stored there. So it's like a big library or a database, if you like, of all of your past information and experience and everything that you know gets stored in there. That's the thinking brain. The second part of your brain is located just below the head and it's the emotional brain, the feeling brain. This is the part of your brain that's responsible for how you feel. And it can make you feel good, you know, loving, creative, grateful, all those things, or it can make you bad, feel bad, stressed, worried, afraid. It's all controlled by the emotional brain. Okay, the third part of the brain is at the back of your head. It's called the survival brain. And this is the, the bit that's responsible or looks after everything about you that keeps you alive. You know, with, not that you're thinking about, but you're like your breathing, your heart rate, all of your organs, the things that are happening automatically um, to keep you alive. This is controlled by your survival brain, everything to do with your survival, in other words. And it has one other very important function to do with your survival. I'm sure people have heard of this as well. And that is, well, the classic example is in prehistoric times, you're walking along the jungle, feeling the jungle path, and a lion jumps out at you from the, from the bushes and roars at you. So yeah. what your brain tell, it tells you in that instance is you're faced with an immediate threat to your survival, something mm -hmm. that could really harm you or even kill you. So there's a mechanism in this survival part of your brain to deal with that. And it's Is that your, also well, what they call the reptilian brain? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's actually the oldest and most primitive, if you like, part of the brain because it's the most instinctual part. There's no thinking or creativity or anything. It's just reaction and function in this part of the brain. It's all, but it activates this thing called, we've probably heard too, called the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. This is your reaction to danger. So. The way that happens is when your brain, remember, it's looking at everything coming in and saying and, and storing all this information and your emotional brain is actually working and saying, is this safe or dangerous? If it's safe, it releases chemicals to make you feel good. So you go, life's great. Everything's good. I feel happy. But if it sees a danger, the lion running at you from the forest, an immediate threat to your survival, it activates different chemicals that make you feel fear and stress. And what that does is gets your, get your brain to focus all of its attention and all of its resources on dealing with that, that immediate threat or danger to get rid of it. So with a lion, you're going to shout out for help or run away or stand and fight. Whatever it is, it's just going to be a reaction to get rid of that danger. So that's a really important survival feature that we have thanks to our brain, to be able to react to an immediate danger and, and get rid of, hopefully, an immediate threat to our survival. Yeah. So there are three parts of the brain, but the fourth part of the brain is in many ways the most important, and that's what I call the creative brain. So this isn't your thinking brain, it's not your feeling brain, and it's not your, your survival brain. It's, this is the part of your brain that's responsible for things like your imagination, your creativity, your gut feelings about things. It's where you get a, a new awareness or you just know something's right or it isn't right. It's also responsible for um, your imagination and also your motivation. It's where you feel motivated. So it's when you're feeling your most re resourceful, creative, imaginative, all of those things. Now, what's interesting about that, all of those things, when, we, when do we feel our most imaginative, creative, and resourceful when we're being the best we can be. Because remember, that is being the best we can be. Mm -hmm. So our creative brain is the part that is designed specifically and primarily to maneuver our life so that we have everything in our life to make us the best that we can be. So we make the right decisions, we have the right ideas, the right information, and it also creates the right circumstances for us as well. Remember, the brain is virtually infinite in its power. So from a lower level of awareness, we call thing, we have words like luck, coincidence, synchronicity. They are not random events. These are created by our creative brain, which is saying, I want to bring you all of the people, all of the situations, all of the circumstances that you need to be the best that you can be, be the happiest you can be. And that's what, as I say, what happened to me. Things were coming to me and still do. 
that, that were, were like, well, how did that happen? I, I would never have dreamt that that was going to happen. And it, you know, something just came out of the blue. So the point is, with the way the brain works, is you're supposed to live in this creative state all of the time, virtually all of the time. You're supposed to be feeling good. You're supposed to be feeling happy. You're supposed to be getting the right ideas on what to do. You're supposed to be making the right decisions. You're supposed to be avoiding making mistakes, the wrong decisions. And you're supposed to be motivated to follow through on your ideas. And you're supposed to attract to you the right people, the right circumstances and situations that's, that keep you in this happy state, in this resourceful, creative state. And it's when you're contributing with your new ideas to yourself and to the rest of society as well. But there's only one time you're not supposed to feel good. And that's when the lion comes running out at you from the jungle. Yeah. And what the brain does then is really interesting because it puts all of its focus and, att and attention on dealing with that danger, as I said earlier. So it takes resources from any other part of you that aren't useful in that situation, and it, and it takes that energy to divert it to dealing with that danger. So, of course, you know, on a physical level, when you when you're ready to attack something or when you're reacting, your heartbeat goes up, your breathing rate quickens, and you feel fear and anxiety to deal with that threat and danger. Now, that's absolutely perfect for what it is. But the problem, if you like, is that when your brain is in that state, it's trying to deal with an immediate threat or danger. In other words, when you feel fear, stress, worry, or anxiety, your brain is telling you that there's an immediate threat to your survival. So, and it's drawing all the resources out to deal with that, but it also shuts down your creative brain because not only does it use the resources from there for the energy for fighting off the danger, but you don't need your creativity, your imagination, your, your big picture thinking, your feeling good when, you've, when you're faced with an immediate threat or danger. In fact, you can't have that. If, if you're feeling good thoughts when the lion's about to attack you, you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be eaten, aren't yeah. you? That part of your brain is of no use to you and, in fact, is detrimental to you when you're faced with an immediate danger that you just need to react to. Right. Do, what, do something violent to get rid of that. So the way the brain is designed to work is you're happy living in this creative state. You're feeling resourceful. You know, sometimes we have words. It's been described by artists, musicians as being in the flow, in this, being in the zone. You've probably heard that. Yeah, you know, sometimes the music, like musicians you know, and guitarists and singers. Yeah, and, and they say artists, you know, singers, com yeah. composers, people who write music say, "I just heard the music and I wrote it down. I don't know where it came, or I played it. I don't know where it came from. It wasn't yeah. through my thoughts. This is all the creative brain at work. So the way we're supposed to live is we're supposed to be happy all the time, being our best, uh, feeling really good, contributing to our own survival and our own." thriving if you like and okay. that of society except when the lion comes running in the out of the jungle <laughs> that's the only time we're supposed to not be the best that we can be but what's the problem most people's brains are living in that fear state most of the time in other words they've somehow tricked their brain and there's lots of reasons for this but their brain is, is not able to see the difference between a, a real fear a real danger like the lion coming at you or someone about to attack you, and an imaginary fear, like something you read on the news about what might happen to the world in six months or tomorrow or whatever. Your brain has mixed all this up due to the input that it's had. But the problem is, and so it's putting you in this fear, fearful, anxious, worried state. But the problem is when you feel fear, anxiety, and worry, you're shutting off the part of your brain that has the resources to give you the life you really want to have. And one of the biggest problems is people are trying to solve problems when they're in that state, but the problem solving part of their brain is blocked off to them. They don't have access to it. Yeah. And, and this is what I realized why things, the difference between people who are able to be resourceful and the people who are just held back and can't see what to do and make mistakes and create problems for themselves a lot of the time, is it's not that they want to be like that. It's just the way they're using their brain is making them feel the stress and fear. And just the, the sheer physical fact of feeling stress, fear, and worry 
is your brain shutting off your creative resources. Wow. So you can't create your ideal life in that state. This was a huge revelation to me when I finally realized it because what I realized, or what I did realize, the obvious thing, the only enemy you have in your life is fear. True. It's feeling bad. That's it. Because when you feel bad, you're in the survival state. You don't have access to all the resources of your creative brain. And I thought, well, where have I heard that before? The enemy is fear. Funnily enough, it's in the Bible. The Bible is a, is a manual on how to use your brain because it says more than 360 times in the Bible, be not afraid, have no fear, trust, believe. And it's not saying that because it's not saying, please, would you mind trying not to be afraid? And, you know, it's saying be not afraid because yeah. that's not how your brain is designed to work. You can't create your ideal life when you're shutting off the, these, your creative brain's resources by feeling fear. So you've got to find a way to create your life not in a fear state, if you like. And everybody's, pretty much everybody's trying to do it the other way around, aren't they? They're feeling all this fear, stress, and worry, and they're trying to figure out how to get out of that state yeah, while so that, that they state. feel good. And it's just, it can it's never happen. happen that way. Yeah. No. So people keep trying. They set more goals. They read more books. They go to, like I used to do. I did all that stuff. You know, go to more courses, try and get get more information, trying to figure out all, all of these things and still made mistakes, still had problems, still had lots of stress. So it's like a snowballing effect until you realize, until you break the cycle and realize you've got to see that fear is the problem. That is the problem. Thanks for being on a little less fear <laughs> podcast. Uh, that's what I loved about the title of your show. I thought this is a perfect thing to talk about. It really is because it was it was as soon as I was able to break down my own fears that I was able to write a book and I was able to come out being transgender and I was able to make this podcast. I mean, it's really fear that gets in the way of everything. And I absolutely 100 percent agree with you. Once I get into that creative zone, everything comes to me after afterwards. It's like I'm a satellite and the satellites activated and I don't need to go seek things anymore. It's really amazing and it's beautiful. That's your brain, the infinite power of your brain at work. It's doing its job. Yeah, it's, drive, it's, it's doing the driving. We all do. Yeah. And I'm really Our glad point. that I had you on the show to be able to talk about this because I really want the world to know that everybody has this ability. It's our innate nature and it's what we're here to do. Thanks so much for so, being yeah. a little less for your podcast, Liam. How can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners find you and your books? Well, everything's on my website, which is just liamnaden.com. It's my name. And I've got a podcast there where I go into a lot more detail about how your brain works and how to use it the right way and how to how to get rid of the fear that's holding you back because fear is the enemy. And what's the name of your podcast and how can we find your podcast? My podcast is also on my website. It's called Using Your Brain for Success. Love it. Great. Using Your Brain for Success. I'm definitely going to tune in. Liam Naden, everybody, how to achieve the results you want using your brain the right way. And I'm definitely going to keep using my brain the right way. I hope all our viewers and watchers and our listeners can definitely learn and gain from this and start using the creative part of their brain and know that it's all love. That's creation and creation is love. And that's your higher self and your higher purpose. Thanks so much, Liam. Uh, Liam, I really appreciate you giving us all of your information and that's really incredible what you went through in your 40s to just turn around and come back and just realize your life's purpose after that. That's really amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a fun journey. And um, I'm glad it happened because that's why we're talking. <laughs> exactly. And that's why you're, yeah. you're helping change the world. Thank you so much. And we're definitely going to keep in touch. That'd be great. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.